This is PBS. About Your House with Bob Yap was partially underwritten by the National Trust for Historic Preservation. In past places and future spaces, from main streets to back roads, we're helping Americans bring preservation home. The National Trust for Historic Preservation. Welcome to today's program, and we're calling it, What's Your Style? Now, you know, all across America, people live in homes, but it's amazing to me how few people really understand the style of home that they live in. Now, this is a Victorian era neighborhood, and that's the key word. You might live in a craftsman era or arts and crafts era, all different kinds of eras, but you don't live in a Victorian style house. There is no such thing. It's the Victorian era, and you live in a house that's within the era. There's a lot of different styles in there, and we're going to talk about that particular era today, the Victorians. Now, it technically started back in 1837 and went to 1901. That's the reign of Queen Victoria. Now, look at the picture of her. This is one homely, mad-looking woman, but she was the one that spurred all this high-style stuff. Now, in America, actually, the Victorian era was around 1860 to 1900. And industrialization is what made it boom big time because we didn't have to timber frame houses anymore into the box shapes. We could now do what we call balloon framing with wire nails. Everything was cut in the factories. It really made it really simple. And we had railroads to ship stuff so you could get all this fancy millwork. We had all kinds of different shapes now. I mean, it was a high style era. In fact, I'm gonna take you right now and show you one of the houses that started just before the Victorian era but bled heavily into it. And that style is Italianate. Now, Italianate style houses had their heyday in America from about 1840 to 1885. And it started with what we call the picturesque movement over in England, of course. Seems like a lot of that comes from England. And what it was was this fantasy of getting back to classical architecture. And it was kind of a model on the modest farmhouses in Italy, out in the countryside. You know, brackets, sometimes towers, things like that. Now, Andrew Jackson Downing, he was this guy that put out a book, it was a pattern book, several of them actually, from 1840 to about 1850. It had lots of Italianate structures in them and it really popularized things. Now in America, of course, popularizing things happened a lot in newspapers and magazines and it went like crazy. Now in the early 1870s, we had a panic, a financial crash in this country, almost a depression. And architecture kind of waned off. They were still building a few Italianates, but by the end of the decade, Things came back, and what we saw were Queen Anne's. Very fascinating. Now, there's a whole bunch of features on this modest Italianate that will give you exactly what Italianate means as far as detailing and architecture. And here's a very common feature on an Italianate, and that's a wide overhanging eave. Now, the eave is the end of the roof, and you can see that it's supported by brackets. You see those brackets up there? Some people call them corbels. Big part of an Italianate. They're everywhere. Now, windows are really important. This is two over two, two panes of glass over two panes. Arch top on the top, the glass and the storms are arched too. It really is very common in this type of architecture. Now, over here you see a round window up in the top of the gable. Well, if you want to look down at the river where we live, you can look out there. Lots of different styles of windows could go up in this gable, but it was very common in this type of house. Now, another part that I love are the porches. Take a look at this one. It has square posts. They're camfered or beveled on the edges. It's very small, not big. It has really nice whoop de doo type brackets and moldings all over the place. These little porches are really nice. I love them. Now, another feature that I like as well are the bay windows. This is on the south side of the house, and it lets light in from the south and just bays the room. One more point about the way these houses were built. Now, all across the country, they were frame or brick, eh, rarely stone. But out here in the Midwest, brick was predominant because we had brickyards everywhere. And they were really, really nice. And they're red brick, beautiful. But they need some repointing sometimes. Now, I'm going to take you inside and show you all the great Italianate features. Let's go. Oh, 
Well, I'll tell you what. The staircase is the focal point when you walk into most houses, and no less with this Italianate. What I love about it is that it has what we call an Italianate null post. It's classic of the style. It has a tapered center that comes down eight sides, square bottom, and a nice round top on it with a highly molded railing coming up. And if you look at these spindles, they're tapered as well, and they're all made out of walnut. I mean, it is gorgeous. It even has a little whoop de doo curve at the top, and you're going to see that a lot in Italian eight houses. Now, something else I love are the doors. In some of the fancier, bigger, palatial Italian eights, you're going to see arched top doors. Well, what they've done to get that impression, these are original, is they've arched the glass. Stain and leaded glass are going to be in these types of houses a lot too. Now, the house was in bad shape, so it was all gone, and they had a local artist make this, and he did a just, just an incredibly great job. Another thing that you're going to see that shows right when you walk into the foyer is this highly molded woodwork. Now, again, in those big palatial houses, you're going to see layered on layered different types of Italianate woodwork, but what you're seeing here is a simple little molding laid over a flat piece of trim. Very much Italianate. But nice. I mean, you know, this house is designed to live in. It's a family home. It's not a big palace. It's a family home. And that's the type of home that you and I are probably going to be living in. And that's why we like to talk about them. Now, in the next room are two sisters by the last name of Prude. They're going to tell us all about how they got the house, why they even bothered, maybe a little bit about the nightmare of renovating it. And there's a story here that will blow your mind. Let's go talk to them. Oh, I love scrub pine woodwork. I just, uh, hi, guys. Hi. Good to see you. Nice to see you. All right. Lisa Prude. How you doing? Vicki Prude. Hello. They are urban pioneers, and I mean, yeah, sure. And I mean that in the biggest sense because you guys took what I thought, and listen, I'll renovate an outhouse if I can, but this thing was in bad shape. What possessed you to buy this house? It's been in our family for four generations. So. Four? Four generations. Four. Yes. And what, what's that all about? It's my great grandmother and my my grandmother and then my mother and then us too. <gasps> That's amazing. Yeah, it was vacant for twelve years and we either had to fix it up or the city was going to tear it down. What did what what? How, why did they move out the twelve years prior? Just got wanted to move out to something newer or something oh, yeah. like that. You know, that happens a lot in these central city historic neighborhoods. Right. Yeah, my mom just happened to keep the taxes up, and she deep down wanted somebody to fix it up over the years. And we were older and decided to do it. So uh, the people were people calling to tear it down or buy it or. I mean, well, yeah, both. Um, we had several. Firemen call, policemen call, but they wanted to buy the property for nothing, so. Make a parking lot exactly. or something like that. So, that would have been no good. Because right. it's a gorgeous house in yeah. every single way. And she wanted us to keep it in the family somewhere, somehow, so we decided to tackle, tackle on the project. You said that un other than like the mechanical stuff, like the furnace and the wiring, you guys pretty much did all this yourself and with some help of your family as well. Well, the majority of it was my family. We did most of the work, except like I said, the, you know, the electrical and the plumbing and the heating. Are you all still speaking? <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah. No, you, you really have done a wonderful job, and you deserve that award. What I love about Italian eight houses is all the different features. So we're going to take everybody and show them the features of your house so that they get an idea of what Italian eight really is. Sure. Here's that southern bay window from the inside. Look at the ceiling. It's all wood, very natural, letting light in. They've got some nice shades on it, but boy, I love bay windows, and they are a major feature of any Italianate. Another thing that you're going to see are these big, tall, heavily molded doors. Now, it has a raised panel and then some moldings around the raised panel. Boy, that is really common, but look at this. That's a pocket door sliding on the floor instead of with the track up at the top. This is a really early one. Now, throughout today's program, we're going to show you a drawing, just like you're seeing here, of the style of house that we're talking about. Now, these drawings came from a field guide to American houses written by Virginia and Lee McAllister, and it is the Bible of house styles in America today. Well, this program, What's Your Style, all originated from all the letters, emails, and faxes I've gotten over the years about people wanting to know what style their house is. And one of the big ones I get, especially in the Victorian era, is what does Second Empire mean? Well, let's go take a look. Well, let's start off with just a little bit of history about the Second Empire. Now, the Second Empire was the reign of Napoleon III, mid-1800s to the 1870s, and it was the Second Empire of France. 
Now, how that all ties in is that a guy named Louise Mansart, back in the 17th century, was a French architect, and he came up with a design for a roof structure like you see up here. Now, a lot of them are almost a virtually vertical roof line. This one has a little bit of a pitch, and then it comes down and whoops on the end. It has a big crown at the top and a crown and cornice underneath, and that is the main thing that Louise Mansart came up with. Now, some people even think that that was done to avoid paying property taxes on living space within a shingled roof area. And I don't know if that's true or not, but it sounds romantic. This particular house is a great example. Now, look at this one. This house is called Terrace Hill. It's in Des Moines, Iowa. It was built in 1869, and it is the quintessential, the number one example of Second Empire mansard roofed architecture in America. I mean, there are others, but this one is really great. Towers, all the bracket work, but it also relates very well to our modest Second Empire house. I mean, you know, you and I can't afford to renovate big, gigantic monsters. This is a little bit more in our league, I think. And it has lots of the same features that you saw in Terrace Hill. In fact, well, let's take a look at some of those features. Well, getting that tower into a Second Empire house seems to be pretty important. Remember the big two towers on Terrace Hill? Well, look at this little one. It's kind of bizarre, but it's a little tower, no question about it. Now, here's something that we saw in the Italian 8 house, a southern-facing bay window. Let's that light in. Very common on Second Empire as well. And so are brackets. You're going to see brackets underneath the eaves all around Second Empire houses. Just a very common feature of that era. Now take a look at that window. That's interesting. And I love this dormer. It's almost dutchy with a gambrel roof to it. I mean, they, dormers were a big part of all this Second Empire architecture. No question about it. Some other features you're going to see are chimneys. Now look at the corbeling or the detail work on this chimney. It's a cross. Everybody had their style that they wanted. And this dormer, more of a shed type of a dormer, but look at the pierced cutouts there. I mean, that is beautiful. Dual windows, arch top. These are the kinds of whoop de doos you're going to find on all kinds of houses from this era. Well, I always love walking into these historic houses because they just, well, they just exude history and architectural details. Throw my coat over there. A couple things about this I like. First of all, it was built in 1875 by a guy named Richard Quincy. Now, Richard Quincy was a buggy maker. They do a lot of steam bending and everything. Well, take a look at this railing. And it's all steam bent, and it's all worked together. It's beautiful, and it's very Italianate in its nature, like that house we just looked at. It has the eight-sided newel posts and the eight-sided baluster and spindles, all walnut. It's beautiful, and it winds all the way up to a balcony. I just love stuff like this. There's a lot of other great features in this house. Let's take a look at some of them. Well, much like the Italian eight doors that we were looking at before, this Second Empire has heavily molded Italian eight doors and woodwork, and they go all the way up to the top really tall. I mean, they're gorgeous doors, and they really hold a lot of attention. Also, feather grain, that's where they painted cheap wood to look like really expensive wood was real popular, and that's what's going on here, as well as a transom to let air flow. And then, of course, you have to have a fireplace. Well, they used these to heat with in the old days. But look at the arch top there on that stone fireplace. That's a recurring theme throughout all of this. Another style within the Victorian era is what we call the shingle house. I just love them because they have shingles all over them. And in fact, this is a later example, just after the turn of the century, of a shingle house. Front porch has shingles, second floor has shingles, the dormers up at the top have shingles. It does have clapboard on the first floor, and you'll see some shingle houses that'll be shingle all the way down to the ground. Now this had its start out in New England, or around the coastal areas where they had resorts and things. And of course, the popular magazines picked it up right away and ran with it, and you'll see them all over the country. And they vary in style. There's gambrels, there's side gables like this one, front gate, all different types. In fact, I want to take a minute and show you a whole bunch of different features on this one that are very indicative of that entire style. Now here's a porch, very big part of any shingle house, and it's a pretty good sized porch. It's got a railing at the top and an elliptical arch. That's kind of an odd shaped arch there, and I think they're really a neat feature of these particular houses. Now take a look at the corner where the shingles meet on the second floor. They're mitered. There's no trim boards. That's a very big part of this. Down below where the clapboard is is a trim board, but not where the shingles are. 
Now the dormers have shingles all over them. They're renovating this house, so they're gonna look better in the future. But you have a chimney, of course. The gable end is all shingled with cedar shingles, just like the dormers are. And then you have a little bay sticking out there. And that works out real nicely. Well, it's two stories. It's a little different on the bottom than it is up on the top. A lot of texture in these types of houses. And that's one of the features you want to look for in any shingle style house. Now the chimney has a little kick in right there about halfway up with some stone. Nice features, you know what I'm saying? It goes up through there. Fireplace works like a charm. Those are some great features. Now the heyday of the shingle house was about 1880 to 1900 and a little bit beyond like this one. They're all over the country. And there's another one I want to show you because these folks are renovating the outside and the inside of this house. And I can't really show you the inside and all the features that go along with shingle. But the other one I want to show you, it's a gambrel roof, kind of like a barn. Well, I'll explain all that. Let's go take a look at the inside of that one. While the inside of this particular gambrel roof shingle house has a lot of really unique features, it also typifies a lot of this period in this style of house. In fact, this house was built in 1894. Well, here's a picture right here of how it used to look on the outside. Now, that original porch isn't there anymore, but the owners are renovating the house, so they're going to put it back on. Well, some of the features that do typify this era, the shingle style era, well, look at this balustrade right here. Now, it has square spindles or balusters and two big square newel posts. Now, the squareness is really an arts and crafts era design, so there's a transition here, but look at this. Square top, big overhanging, square column coming down on the newel, and then this cutout is almost mission looking. It's got a couple little square buttons on it, very typical of that period of time. You have to understand that the arts and crafts movement started in 1900 and went on to the 1920s, and this house was built in 1894, so people were starting to get into that mode. In fact, another couple of things that you see around here, well, look at this right here, this oak paneling, all quarter sawn oak, very dark. All the woodwork is very dark. Take a look at this ceiling, though. Now, this is amazing. In the Craftsman era, everybody wanted to expose their beams for honest construction to show how everything was constructed. But look at the recessed ceiling. It's tongue and groove beadboard. It's just gorgeous. In fact, this house has a lot of unique features. Why don't we just take a look at a few? Well, windows are a big part of any house's style, and they really wanted that kind of cottage look in the shingle. So you had nine over nine, that's nine panes of glass over the top of nine panes of glass, and a double hung window. It's a nice feature. And look at how open this is. Well, that has to do with that transition, wanting to get away from the Victorian boxy rooms. And then, of course, that honesty in construction during the arts and crafts movement with this beam ceiling, that's a big part of it as well. And you can't have a house in a shingle house anyway without a fireplace. And this is a beautiful one. It's got mahogany and stone around the outside of it. I mean, this is absolutely a gorgeous house. Hardwood floors are everywhere. These are all the types of features you're going to see. And in the kitchen here, the original built-in kitchen cabinets. They've got great glass doors and the cupboards. Now they put new handles on them, but they still look as marvelous as they used to. Well, considering all the questions I've had about what is a shingle-style house, I think we've answered some of them for you today. At least I hope so. It's a great architectural style. Hey, Bob. Yeah. Your peanut butter sandwich is ready. Peanut butter. Do I get jelly, too? Of course. <laughs> All right. Peanut I better take my coat, though. My crew drives me like a mule. And if I don't have my coat, I might have to eat this thing on a run. I'll go. I'm coming. I'm coming. <laughs>
Well, any classic Queen Anne is going to have what we call a turret or a tower with a spire like that. Does that look like from a medieval castle or what? Dormers up in the roof line like you see up there. That's going to be real common. Chimneys sticking out with corbeling. And look at the curved glass on that tower and how it comes down on the top of, of course, a big wraparound porch. Now, any Queen Anne without a wraparound porch eh, may not be worth its salt, but this one certainly is. Look at that thing. It's gorgeous. It's all arched. And remember, texture is so much a part of everything Queen Anne. Asymmetrical with lots of texture. Now, what I like about this porch is the detailing. You see that molding? That's called egg and dart. Very classical. And then these columns are called Tuscan columns. They don't have fluting or anything. And they come from Tuscany, which is over in Italy. Now they're sitting on top of stone bases. I mean, this house has everything. This window right here with the arch on the top and the side lights is what we call a Palladian window. And it sits on top of a bay, two-story bay. Bay windows keeps coming up, that theme. Well, there are certainly a lot of different stylistic elements on the outside of a Queen Anne. Well, look at this iron gate. I love this. Landscaping has always been a big part of Queen Anne's. But inside this baby is a treasure trove of some of the greatest Queen Anne elements you've ever seen. Let's go take a look. <laughs> I tell you what, this staircase epitomizes the high-end decoration of the Victorian era especially the late Queen Anne architecture, which this house was built in 1901, if you remember. Now, it's down on the Mississippi River in Davenport, Iowa, and we have double newel posts here, big ones like this, but what I wanted to show you here was the top is carved with oak leaves, hand-carved. We have a lot of oak trees around here in the Midwest, which is neat. Now, this railing comes down here, and these beautiful classic acanthus leaves are just wrapped around here, all hand-carved. I mean, it doesn't get much better than this. But here's another element I just love. These are called balusters or spindles, and look how they're spiral turned. And then right up here on top is a column capital right on top of there. Just gorgeous. This is really unusual. I love this. The other thing about it that's really neat is it moves up. It sweeps up like, like a labyrinth of different types of railings and spindles or balusters, as we call them, to a balcony overlooking the stairwell itself. You know, the Victorians were really into this stuff. There's no doubt about it. But there's other elements in this house that show the whole Queen Anne era just beautifully. Let's take a look at those. Well, now don't forget, the Victorian era was basically possible because of mechanization, manufacturing, and the railroads. And here's a mail order fireplace. It's got stone on the front and wood and a French polished mirror above. Also, some things you could order were classical columns. Now, this is a big doorway between the front hall and the parlor, and up at the top of this fluted column are ionic capitals, like we saw in the staircase. So they're picking up different elements, plus a structural that's holding up a big header over the doorway. Now, 1901, remember, was when this was built, so it's a little bit transitional into the arts and crafts era. People wanted more space, so big, wide pocket doors like this. And by the way, those pocket doors are tracked on the top instead of the bottom, like the Italian eat house we saw before. Now, fireplaces keep coming up. They're all over Queen Anne houses, big and small. And this one has some nice carving on it, and it's got a marble face. And they were also practical. People used them to heat quite a bit in these houses because they didn't have central heating in the beginning. Now, built-ins, whether they're in kitchens or bathrooms or dining rooms like these, they're going to also be in Queen Anne houses. And these two are right next to a buffet. <music> appropriate to me to end the show on Victorian era architecture right here in a 1901 highly decorative Queen Anne because in fact it was the end of the Victorian era. People got sick of all the high decoration and all the ornamentation and wanted something that was a little bit more honest and that started the arts and crafts movement around 1900. Well that's for another show. Thanks for spending some time with me today. Until next time, I'm Bob Yap about your house.
About Your House with Bob Yap was partially underwritten by the National Trust for Historic Preservation. In past places and future spaces, from main streets to back roads, we're helping Americans bring preservation home. The National Trust for Historic Preservation. <laughs> 